So in this section, um, what we're gonna do is derive the heat equation for a one dimensional rod um, from physical principles, okay? Um, and so uh, recall, well, what is the heat equation? So the form or one form of writing this is, right, du dt is some constant times du um, d squared u dx squared, where u is a function of x and t. And we interpret this as um, the, the temperature, which is something we can measure or we usually measure, okay? So the goal for this section is to derive um, the heat equation for a one dimensional rod. Okay, and so how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna start by kind of introducing and discussing um, this quantity that we'll call just heat energy or thermal energy. Um, and we'll give, maybe I'll write it here, we'll give kind of an infinitesimal infinitesimal derivation of like, a, you might say like half of the heat equation. After which we'll give um, kind of another equivalent uh, derivation using what we'll call a conservation law. Um, and so uh, both of these derivations will give us an equation, but it will be in terms of this quantity called thermal energy. Um, and it'll involve this quantity that we'll call um, kind of flux. Um, and so kind of the next two parts are then uh, kind of translating those pieces into the language of, of temperature, right? So the first one will be, right, going from uh, thermal energy to temperature and making that uh, translation. Uh, after which we'll introduce this um, kind of physical observation, usually called Fourier's law, um, which lets us connect this notion of flux or flow of energy to the temperature of, um, of the material. Okay. So heat energy, what is the starting point for all of this? Well, um, kind of throughout the section, right, we're gonna be considering kind of a one-dimensional rod. What do we mean by a one-dimensional rod? For us, it's gonna look something like this, okay? Where it has length L, okay? And so what that means for us is that over here, we're gonna treat kind of this left endpoint uh, uh, with the coordinate X equals zero. And then the right endpoint is going to be x equals l. Okay, so this is going to be our rod. Um, and so the first quantity that we're going to introduce is this kind of abstract uh, quantity called thermal energy, and in particular, this thermal energy density. Okay, and so what this function kind of uh, tells us is just how much energy there is per unit volume. Um, in this rod, okay? And so um, I should say, so yeah, one, one assumption that we're gonna make throughout this derivation is that um, no energy is gonna flow kind of radially through the rod, okay? Energy is only gonna flow from left to right. Um, stated kind of in another way. Uh, so if you take, uh, so let me draw it like this. So if you take kind of a cross section of this rod and then blow it up. Okay. And then you ask, well, uh, take a bunch of points on this rod Right, so this point in the center, that's gonna be kind of this um, medial axis or the center of this rod. Um, but then you can also look at points, you know, radially a little further away from the center. And so then you might ask for each of these points, right, what is the thermal energy density, right? Say they all have the same X coordinate, but radially, right, 
um, kind of they're, they're at different lengths from the center. And so what this assumption right here, kind of another way to interpret this is all of these points you know, that I've drawn, these all have the same um, thermal energy density, right? And so in general, when we're kind of talking about these 1D rods, we're always gonna be making this assumption that, right, nothing matters radially. The only uh, coordinate or the only thing that really matters is, right, kind of how far along the rod you are, okay? So all properties of this material, all properties of these functions, of this temperature, of this uh, thermal energy density, they're not gonna depend, uh, depend radially. They're just gonna depend um, kind of, you know, how far along the rod you are, okay. Um, cool, so we have the geometry, we have this abstract thermal energy density. Um, so let's start working with it. So our starting point is going to be um, kind of computing what the total energy is in a thin segment. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, pick a point X, pick a point a little to the right, X plus delta X. Okay, make those two um, cross-sectional things. And so what we're interested in now is the total amount of energy, total thermal energy contained in this kind of infinitesimally small um, segment. Okay, so keep in mind that, right, this thermal energy density, this was, um, right, energy per volume. Okay, so if we just want to end up with energy, right, well, we need to multiply thermal energy density um, times the volume. So the question is, well, what is the volume, oops, what is the volume of this uh, infinitesimal segment? Well, let me write it out here. So. We have thermal energy density times A times delta X. Delta X, right, that's the width of the segment. A, that's gonna be the cross-sectional area of the segment, okay? We've got this, right? So this is gonna give you area, this is gonna give you length, length times area is volume, uh, energy per volume times volume, that's just gonna be this energy. Um, and that's our total energy for the segment of the rod, okay? So now what we're gonna ask is, well, how does this energy change in time? Okay, and of course, you know, we're not saying a lot about how the system is behaving, what's happening, um, but, what we're gonna be able to do is get actually quite a bit of um, you know, stuff um, without a lot of assumptions, okay? So let's see how that goes, right? So the main question is, how does this quantity, the total energy, how does this change in time? Okay, um, okay. and so the observations are, right, well, the assumption that we made is that energy is only going to flow from left to right, say, or um, right, it's not going to flow radially. Okay, so if we take a small segment of this rod, right, well, how are we going to gain or lose heat? One possibility is, uh, or how are we going to gain or lose energy? One possibility is that energy is going to kind of flow from the left um, into the segment or it's gonna to flow to the right out of the segment, okay? So here's our picture. Our segment looked like this. Okay, so we're gonna have energy flowing there or we're gonna have energy flowing out there, okay? So that's kind of this first possibility. The other possibility, let me go with you know, orange. The other possibility is just any energy that's spontaneously created or removed from the system, okay? Um, 
So this is not something I'm, nece I'm necessarily going to draw in this uh, kind of picture, but you can think of this as, right, maybe within the rod, there's some sort of chemical reaction that's generating energy. Um, maybe you're holding a, um, a lighter to the rod and that's adding energy. Um, anything like that, okay? So kind of the second piece, this is just gonna be a black box for anything else that could happen um, kind of spontaneously, or maybe in a sense, not intrinsic to um, the system, okay? Right, so heat energy is gonna flow across, is either gonna flow across the um, boundary pieces or it's gonna be generated or removed spontaneously, okay? So what is the rate of change of heat energy in time? Right, so we're looking for a time derivative of the total energy, which um, previous slide we said was this quantity, right? Okay, and so now what we need to do is kind of quantify, right, what these other two terms are, right? Heat energy flowing and then heat energy that's generated or removed. So for the second one, heat energy uh, generated inside per unit time, that's going to be this quantity that we're going to call Q of X comma T, okay? Um, oftentimes we'll call this a source term, um, but it's just, again, some black box for anything else that can, that can happen. And so kind of uh, for notational convenience, what we're actually going to do is kind of work with this heat energy generated or moved this function right here is going to be energy per volume, I guess per time, because we have a derivative over here, okay? Um, so because it's per volume, we need to multiply a volume, um, or we need to multiply by a volume element. So we're gonna multiply by this A um, delta X. So this whole term, this whole term corresponds to how much energy is spontaneously generated in the segment. Maybe like if you're holding a lighter there. Okay. Now for this other term, right, heat flowing across the boundaries, what we're going to do is introduce a function that we're going to call phi, okay, um, and this is going to be flux kind of through uh, the rod, okay, and so flux just means, right, flow of quantity generally, and so what this phi is going to kind of encode is the amount of stuff that's flowing kind of at a point at any given time, okay? Um, yeah, so this flux phi, this corresponds to, you know, let me zoom in. So if you take like a point, say right there, this flux phi is gonna tell you how much is flowing through that point. Okay, now a priori, this quantity is just for a single point. Okay, and so if we want the total amount of energy, right, this abstract quantity, we want the total amount of energy that's flowing across this boundary piece. Um, what we're going to do is multiply this uh, flux by the total area, right? How much is flowing per point times the number of points you have, roughly. Okay, so this quantity right here is how we're gonna mathematically kind of express this notion of um, energy flowing across the boundary. And likewise, right at this other boundary segment, this is gonna be the flux, but now we're looking at points with X coordinate, X plus delta X, of course at time T, um, and then normalized by the area, okay? So going back down here, right? Well, if we wanna know how much energy is flowing across the boundaries, right? So again, take this little segment, question is, how is energy changing? Well, here we're having energy flowing this way, right? How much energy is flowing? Well, it's gonna be phi of X comma TA. So we're gonna pick up, right? V of x comma t times a. Um, okay, 
So that's energy that's entering the segment across this boundary piece. But we also possibly have energy that's leaving the segment through this boundary piece, right? So how much energy are we losing? Well, we're gonna have to take away however much is flowing across that boundary segment. And again, normalized by the area, okay? So what is the total rate of, what is the rate of change, of kind of the total heat energy for the segment? Right, this piece. Well, this quantity is going to be equal to, right, this total flux plus uh, this kind of source term, okay? So written out, right, uh, we have is, right, change in energy is going to be approximately, right, flux across one boundary, flux across the other, and then the source term. Um, so now what we're gonna do is kind of uh, rework this equation a little bit and get into a slightly nicer form. Um, so to do that, what we're gonna do is divide by delta X. Um, so this is the exact same thing from the last slide. Divide by delta X, and I guess technically also as well as A. All right, so uh, A there, A there, A there, those are all gonna cancel. This delta X is gonna move down here. This delta X is gonna cancel with this delta X. So we're gonna left, be left with, right, partial derivative of E with respect to T is approximately this finite difference plus this uh, source term, this black box function Q of X comma T. Okay, um, but now what we're gonna do is, right, right, we were looking at this infinitesimal segment. So now what we're gonna do is let delta X go to zero, okay? And notice that this is going to be minus partial derivative of phi with respect to X. And of course the partial is coming up, right? Because, right, as written here, so sure, phi depends on T as well, but here we're keeping T constant. Right, and we're just uh, kind of looking at this increment um, with respect to x. Right, so we end up with this um, equation that describes the right the change in thermal energy uh, in terms of kind of the this derivative uh, flux plus some source term. Okay. Um, so this is a starting point, but maybe it's not super satisfactory, right? So things we want to do, one, we wanna change, so, uh, so instead of working with this thermal energy density, instead we want to work with um, temperature. The other thing we're going to have to do is um, kind of describe the flux in terms of temperature as well. Yeah, uh, close enough. So I guess technically we could describe the flux in terms of E, sure. Um, but if we're going to end up with temperature, we might as well just go with temperature. Okay, so you could call this expression a heat equation if you want, but a priori it's in terms of two unknowns, E and phi. And so what we're gonna do um, here in a little bit is uh, convert this so that's in terms of temperature and the second unknown function phi is in terms of E or temperature. But before then, we're going to give a similar derivation of the same equation um, of using a slightly different approach. I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of the same, um, but there there are some nuances. That this approach highlights that this the the previous infinitesimal approach did not. 
Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to again uh, consider the total thermal energy. Okay. Um, but now instead of an infinitesimal segment, we're just going to say it's any segment, right? So, uh, right. So that's our total rod. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, what if here x is equal to a and over here x is equal to b? And we're going to compute the total thermal energy in that uh, region. OK. Um, and so of course, A and B can vary, right? We're not specifying what they are yet. Um, and so B could be, you know, A plus delta X, sure. Um, but as of now, A and B can just be anything. Okay, so total thermal energy in that segment is this quantity, right? We need, uh, so we have our thermal, den thermal energy density. This is area. This is a unit of length. So we have right density times volume, that's gonna give us energy. And we're adding up all of these pieces from A to B, okay? So this indeed is gonna be our total thermal energy. Um, how does this change? Well, we need the flux over across the boundaries, okay? Similar to the derivation before, flux along the boundaries is this quantity, okay? Flux at the left end point, normalized by the area, that's entering the region minus the flux at the right end point normalized by the area that that all is leaving this uh, segment this region okay and then similarly right what is the total energy added from the source term this black box kind of whatever else can happen um, that's going to be this quantity here okay so Similar kind of to before, right? I mean, essentially we were working with that conservation law, but whatever. Similar to before, what we're doing is we're saying, well, how does this total thermal energy change in time? That's gonna be, right, flux across the boundaries plus whatever comes from the source, okay? But here, the observation is gonna be that, right, this term right here, right, this different of fluxes, we can write this as an integral from A to B, right? And precisely it's uh, kind of, right? This is the integral, okay? How do we get this? Well, this is just, right? The fundamental theorem of calculus, which says F of B, capital F of B minus capital F of A. This is the integral from A to B of capital F prime of X dx, okay? So that's one form of writing it. Um, and then in our case, we're saying, just so I can actually write it, with capital F of X, this is phi of X comma T times our area A. Okay. Um, so using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can express right this flux across the boundaries as the integral of a derivative. Okay, so plugging that in, right, this is our starting point. Convert this to the integral here. Uh, something else we're doing is we're moving this time derivative inside the integral. Okay, so notice that right, inside this integral, the only thing that depends on time, t, is this function e of x, comma t, right? a doesn't depend on t, um, and dx, right, that's a piece of the integral. Um, so really, we should be saying, well, b and a, they don't depend on t. Um, so yeah, in any case, for us, we're content that moving this derivative inside the integral, that's fine to do. Okay, so, right, converting this to an integral, moving this inside the integral, we're now left with this expression, okay? And the nice thing with this expression, right, is that we have three integrals, right, with respect to the same variable, with respect to the same bounds, 
So what we can do is move everything over to one side and then kind of factor out this integral so that we're left with this expression. Okay. And so of course, since we have an equality and we're moving everything to one side, what we're gonna end up with is, right, this integral is equal to zero, where what are we integrating? Well, we're integrating, right, uh, dE dt, uh, let me write it like this. So we're looking at the integral from A to B of dE dt times A plus d phi dx times A minus Q. Q times A dx is equal to zero. Okay. And so one thing to notice is that, well, this expression in here looks an awful lot like the last kind of version of the heat equation that we um, derived, right? Where we have derivative in E, time derivative of E, X derivative of phi, and then Q kind of all lumped together um, with kind of these signs, okay? So we're really close. And so then the question is, well, how do we go from this integral, you know, this, this integral, uh, to kind of the PDE that we're looking for. Okay. Well, the observation is that, right, this equation holds for every possible A and B. Okay. All right. We didn't specify what the bounds were. We just said, well, whatever the bounds are, this is true. Um, so because we're free to choose whatever bounds we want, um, what we can conclude is that, right, the function that we're integrating must be zero, which may be new and maybe slightly non-intuitive. Um, but one way to see that is, well, so let's uh, kind of change notation so it's a little easier. So, right, the claim is that if this integral is zero, Right, you're given a function f. This integral is zero for all a less than b, then the function must actually be zero. Okay. So, one way we can kind of see this is okay, so draw some axes. Okay, so maybe our function a priori, maybe it looks something like this, okay? Is this a possibility? Well, the answer is no, it's not possible. And one way to see that is, well, say, okay, so what we know is that the integral is gonna be zero, say for any possible A and B. So what if we set A and B right here, okay? And then what we do is we say, well, what is the integral? of this function on this interval, okay? Kind of naively, it's just gonna be the area under, the area under, right, the function, okay? Um, but the assumption that we're making is that, well, right, this integral, the area kind of under this function for that interval has to be zero, okay? So, over this interval, this function cannot look like this, okay? Because if it looked like this, we'd have non-zero area, okay? So this isn't viable, okay? So our conclusion is, well, likely it has to be zero there, okay? And so you may ask, well, okay, what if actually the function maybe was negative and positive and negative and positive in a way so that, right, the area down here canceled with the area over there. And I'd say, yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's a possibility. But then I'd say, well, zoom in a bit and then move your A closer to B. And so now you're in a situation where you integrate, you have positive area. 
Okay, so the conclusion is, well, wherever your function, you know, is strictly above or strictly below the x-axis, um, that's going to contradict this assumption that the integral is zero for any possible a and b. Okay, so the only possibility is that your function cannot be above or below the x-axis anywhere, so your function has to be identically zero. Okay. So all of this discussion is justifying going from this equation to this equation, okay? Um, cool. And so of course, once we're here, if A is constant, you can divide by A and you end up with this expression, which is what we had before, okay? Um, cool. So it's a slightly different um, derivation, we get the same thing, um, but we're still left with right the issue that this equation is in terms of thermal energy, okay, as well as this abstract right flux or flow of energy, okay. And so what we want to do now is convert right thermal energy to temperature and flux to something involving in this case temperature, okay, and then then we'll be happy. Um, so let's do that. So first thing we're going to do is go from E, right, thermal energy, to U, which is going to be our um, temperature. So how do we make this um, conversion? So the observation is that, well, um, if you kind of have a material and um, you want to raise the temperature of that material, depending on kind of the, the temperature of the material itself and kind of other properties of the material, it may take different amounts of energy, you know, to raise that material by say one degree, okay? And so kind of a good example of sort of what we're getting at is um, water, right? And so kind of how we measure this, you know, amount of energy required to raise the temperature of, kind of material um, by one unit of temperature. Uh, so this quantity is, we call specific heat or, and I can write it, um, you may also see specific heat or heat capacity. Um, so this just tells us, yeah, how much energy is required to raise the temperature. And so for water, um, so this figure is taken from Wikipedia. What we can see is, well, if you want to kind of raise the temperature of water from, say, negative, negative 100 to zero degrees, that's going to take approximately, so each of these is 100. So it's gonna take approximately 200, I guess, kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so all of this is relative to say a unit of mass. Okay, um, so it takes a bunch of energy to go from negative 100 to zero degrees. We can see it takes, what is this? About 400 kilojoules to get it from, you might say like, slightly negative to slightly positive, okay? Um, and then if we wanna raise it another 100 degrees, say from um, right, zero degrees to 100 degrees, here it's gonna take about 500,000. So all of this is about, wait, let's see, I did my math wrong. So this right here is about 300 because this is about 200. This is about 300 to go from negative to positive. And then from here, this is gonna be about 400 joules, okay? So to raise water from negative 100 Celsius to zero Celsius takes about 200 joules. To get it from slightly, net, slightly below zero to slightly above zero, it's gonna take a different amount, which in this case is about a little over 400 joules. And then to go from 
um, about zero to 100, it's going to take about another, in this case, 400 joules. And then to go from a little below 100 to a little above 100, you need to add in a whole lot of energy. Okay. Um, right. So different materials take different amounts of energy to raise, right, the temperature of that material one degree. Okay. And so we're going to work with this in terms of, right, these specific heats. Um, they're going to have units energy per mass times temperature. Okay. Um, so let's connect this to what we had before, right? So since specific heat deals with mass, um, we need to incorporate kind of the mass density of our materials. Okay. And so, um, you know, you can make sense of this physically, but even if you just look at the units, right? So let me write it here. So C of X, this was energy per mass times temp, okay? If we then multiply by U of XT, which is gonna be our temperature, right? This is gonna be temp. So this quantity right here now has units energy per mass, okay? So we wanna get rid of this mass. So we need to incorporate something about mass. Most of what we're doing involves uh, kind of volume. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce, right, this rho of X, which is mass per volume. So now this whole quantity, which is specific heat times temperature times mass density of the material, all of this is going to be energy per volume. Um, and so from here, sure, we can conclude that this unit wise should be our thermal energy density. Um, and of course, if you just want energy, you multiply by uh, this volume element here, okay? Um, but for us, this is gonna be, this is gonna be good enough. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so this is what we were looking for, right? Let me highlight it down here. So thermal energy in terms of temperature, it's going to be specific heat, right? Some property of the material times mass density, another property of the material times the temperature of the material. Okay. So in practice, what this means is that whenever we see this E of X comma T in the heat equation, we can replace it by this whole expression, C of X, rho of X, U of X comma T. Okay. Um, so plugging that in, uh, right? So over here, we had the derivative of uh, time derivative of E. The only piece in here that depends on time is U, right? So the time derivative only affects this piece. So that's what we have there. Otherwise, everything else remains unaffected. Okay. Um, so we've done the first step of going from right, thermal energy to temperature. Last thing we need to do is deal with flux and um, relate flux to temperature. Okay. Um, and so that's going to come through this physical principle observation, whatever you want to call it, um, called. Fourier's law, okay? Um, okay, so you know, how we're gonna get Fourier's law, or really what Fourier's law is, is just a number of observations about how heat behaves and intuitively kind of how we know heat is gonna, and kind of temperature and whatever else is gonna behave in practice, okay? Um, so there are four observations, right? So suppose you have a material and uh, you kind of look at two, I don't know, portions of the material, say right next to each other. Um, if the temperature kind of at those two pieces is constant, right, and there's no temperature difference, right, then, you know, heat's not going to flow from one to the other and the temperature between the two is not going to change, 
okay? So if the temperature is constant between adjacent regions, no energy is gonna flow. Um, if there are temperature differences, then heat energy is gonna flow from the hotter region to the colder region. Okay, and so you might interpret this maybe from like a more um, statistical mechanics approach where this energy, maybe you think of as, um, you know, maybe tiny particles vibrating and higher energy means everything's vibrating um, much faster. Um, but in general, right, if you have a hot thing next to a cold thing, a uh, hot thing is going to get cooler, cold thing is going to warm up. Um, and so we interpret that as energy is flowing from hot to cold. Okay. Greater the greater the temperature difference, then the greater the flow of energy. Okay. So if you have, I don't know, cold thing and a hot thing, sure, energy is going to flow. But if you have a really hot thing, energy is going to flow a lot quicker. Okay. And the really hot thing is going to cool faster than the hot thing. Okay. Um, and then finally, the flow of energy, uh, it's going to depend on properties of the material, okay? Um, which we'd expect. Okay, so these are kind of the qualitative properties and observations. And so the question is, well, how do these get incorporated um, mathematically? Okay. And so you know, the main starting point to quantify everything is that uh, kind of starting from the second one, right? So, right, we're interested in what phi is. So looking at the second one, um, I'm gonna say this. So the key thing here is that temperature difference, right? There, there's a difference in temperatures. Um, so you might write that as, Right, what is this flux? This is gonna be proportional to, right, how the temperature is changing. Okay. Um, but we need to make sense of, kind of some of the sign and uh, yeah, start getting at some of these other constants, et cetera. And so for that, what I'm gonna do is go to the next slide show the quantitative version, and then we'll draw some pictures and make sense of what's there. Okay, so quantitatively, Fourier's law says this, right? What is the flux? It's going to be um, minus some constant or some quantity K zero times uh, kind of this, uh, the derivative or the gradient of our temperature. And so um, maybe to clarify, so often in practice, what do these things depend on? Flux is gonna depend on where you are along the rod and time. Um, K zero, this is gonna be some property of the material that's gonna depend kind of where along the rod you are. And then gradient of U in X, that's gonna depend on both space and time. Okay, um, cool. So yeah, but so, okay. So as I was saying, so um, the observation that's gonna depend on the temperature difference, that tells us that this derivative, the spatial derivative of temperature, that's gonna be important. And that's gonna um, say something about this flow. Um, the fact that it flows from hot to cold that is going to get incorporated in um, this uh, kind of the sign right here, okay? And I'll draw a picture in a second to clarify that. Um, before I do, I also wanna say, so what were the other two, right? Flow of heat energy depends on materials and the greater the difference, the greater the flow of energy. So this piece is really saying that flux is proportional to the gradient. Um, so really, three right here determine this uh, proportionality, two right here, this is gonna give us a minus sign. And then this is gonna say that there's gonna be some constant say, depending on the material, okay? Um, so, but let's make sense of this sign right here, okay? So 
say we have a rod like that. And then I'm going to illustrate temperature as a function of above this rod. And so maybe something like this. And so this thing right here is u of x comma t. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at right two adjacent points there and there. Okay. And we're going to ask, right, what is a flux? Where is stuff going? Okay. So the temperature here is larger than the temperature there. So if we look at if we look at the gradient, right, gradient is going to be negative. Okay, just the slope uh, of this curve is going to be negative. Okay, but let's also look at right where we'd expect energy to be flying. Right, what phi is? Okay, so the observation is that energy is going to flow from hot temperature to uh, lower temperature. Okay, so we'd expect the flow to be that way. Okay, so phi right here. This is positive. This is equal to some constant, which generally we keep K zero to be positive. Um, right, if K zero is zero, there's no flow. As K zero increases and is more positive, that's letting more stuff flow through the material. Over here, we have um, du dx. And we said this quantity, this is negative. Okay. So already, left hand side, we have a positive thing, right? Flux uh, phi fluxes from left to right and it's moving from left to right. So this thing is going to have a positive sign. On the right hand side, we have a positive, just some constant. We have a negative thing. Okay, so already the signs are different. So to make everything work out, we'd expect the negative there so that now this whole right side is um, positive. Okay, um, so everything matches what we'd expect. Likewise, let me label this. So suppose we have. Let's see. Suppose we have a temperature distribution that looks like that. Okay. Um, and now, if we take this gradient, this derivative du dx, right? This is this derivative is now positive. Okay. And so the question is, well, where is stuff flowing, right? Where is energy flowing? So the observation is, well, energy is gonna flow from hot temperature to um, lower temperature. So in this case, we'd expect the flux to be from right to left, right? Energy is gonna flow from here down to there or from here over to there, okay? So by our sign convention, Right, if the flux is from right to left, this function phi is going to be negative. Okay. So uh, left hand side is negative, right hand side du dx, we saw this was positive. Okay. So if we didn't have this minus sign right here, then left hand side would be negative, right hand side would be positive. Okay. It should be a contradiction. And so again, this validates, right, we need this negative sign, which is coming from the fact that um, stuff is flowing from hot to cold. If stuff was flowing from cold to hot, negative sign wouldn't be there, but it's cool. Okay, so Fourier's Law is just a bunch of observations about how we'd expect kind of temperature to change, where this energy should flow from. Quantitatively, this is the expression we're working with, right? This quantity phi, this flux, 
is going to be minus some function k0, depending on the material, times the derivative of the temperature. Okay. So let's plug this into the equations that we had, that we got before. Okay. So plugging it in um, to kind of uh, this equation, what do we end up with? Well, uh, right, this, this minus sign from phi is going to cancel with this minus sign in front. So we're going to get a positive right there. Otherwise, we're taking the x derivative of this whole thing. Okay. And we're left with this expression. Okay. Keep in mind that generally, um, say so generally k0, this can be a function of x, okay? Um, so you could distribute this derivative. Just keep in mind that you'd have to use the, um, the, the product rule, okay? Cool. And this was our end goal, well, almost. Um, but this is how he evolves or how the temperature changes for a one-dimensional rod. Um, incorporating physical properties of the rod. Okay, um, cool. So, okay, so one observation is, right, great, this tells us how things are changing. Um, but what we're missing is, right, how things started, okay? So generally, if we actually wanna solve kind of this problem, we also need to specify kind of an initial condition, right? What the temperature was initially. Generally, initial conditions take this form where we say, well, right, U is a solution to this partial differential equation, whatever that solution looks like, um, right? But the solution U, we're gonna specify that at time zero, this is what it looks like. Um, and yeah, and so initial conditions we're going to use extensively, um, but you can think of these as, right, how the system started, and then this heat equation is going to tell you how the system evolves, okay? Uh, and so one other kind of point I'll make is, so assuming, right, C, rho, and in this case, K zero are constant. Uh, what do we get? Well, all right, C rho du dt. This is now gonna be K zero ddx of du dx, say plus Q. Okay. And so now if we divide through by C rho, and then maybe I'll say our constant and Q is equal to zero so that we don't actually have to deal with this. Uh, C rho K zero are constant. So divide through by that, what we're gonna end up with is du dt is equal to K d squared or du dx squared, right? Cause we're taking a derivative of a derivative where K is equal to, in this case, capital K naught over C rho, okay? And this last expression right here, this is exactly kind of the expression that I wrote, um, well, at the start. So this is a special case when we don't have a source and all properties of the material are constant. Um, but if the properties of the material aren't necessarily constant, right, we can still make sense of how temperature is changing and this is how we'd make sense of that. Okay. And this is a heat equation for a one-dimensional rod.